Hello, everyone, and uh, good afternoon. Welcome to uh, this great opportunity provided by our Center on uh, Energy um, for Energy Research, Education, and Service series uh, to learn uh, more about design build, uh, energy efficiency, uh, innovation in the use of materials. Uh, our guest this afternoon to explore those subjects, and I'm sure many more, is Professor Steve Badanes. Uh, Steve is widely known for his practice and teaching of design build. Uh, he's currently a professor in the University of Washington Department of Architecture, where he holds the Howard Wright Endowed Chair of the University of Washington. Steve received his Master's of Architecture from Princeton University in 1971 and one year later, he was the co-founder of the Jersey Devil Design Build Practice in Seattle. The Jersey Devil architecture, uh, architects uh, builders um, leave on site during the construction of their buildings. That's what I read when I Googled the name. And, and Steve will tell us whether that's entirely true or not, so, but I, I thought it was a, a remarkable uh, mention. Um, and they're very well known, as I mentioned before, for their uh, uh, design efficient uh, um, approach and innovation on the use of materials. Uh, the other thing that I found when I Googled uh, uh, the Jersey <laughs> Devil was, was a statement that triggered my curiosity and it said that uh, they put the funk back on functionalism. <laughs> I don't funk know exactly what that means, <laughs> but I, I hope we'll, uh, we'll learn that during the presentation today. Um, Steve um, has received the ACSA Distinguished Professor um, uh, title from the Association of Collegial Schools of Architecture. And it is certainly our pleasure and an honor for us to welcome him back at the CAP. We know that uh, he has visited us, us before and uh, we certainly like the repeat clients. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And uh, with that, please help me welcome Steve to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Guillermo. And thank everybody for coming. Right up in the front, it's great. How about uh, the sound? Everybody can hear all the way in the back? Does that mean yes or no? Good, okay, great. It sounds to me like I'm in an echo chamber. But it, it's, um, I'll, I'll, I'll get used to it. Uh, it's great to be back in Muncie at Ball State. I think it's the first, what's that, Hari? Okay. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> This is the first place that I ever taught, it was 1981 and 82 I taught here. And um, I'm, at the time, I was incredibly impressed with the level of creativity and the work ethic of the students here and the amazing range of projects that were being done. And I'd like to say that in my short tour today, I'd say that that continues. This is a really unique school. Sometimes you don't really know because you seem like you're out in the middle of a play of nowhere or wherever to, to people from the east and west coast, but this is an incredible place and the education here is first rate. So I wanted to say that before I start. Um, some of the visits that I've had here, we have built some things. Uh, I am going to talk today about building, design build, as Guillermo says, as a way both to do architecture, Jersey Devil, and as a way to teach architecture. And I'm going to show some of the things that we have made with the Jersey Devil Design Build Group and some of the things that I've been involved with making with architecture students, art students, engineering students, usually in the service of people who could never afford architecture. I think uh, all of us want to have um, meaning in our lives and we want it embodied in our careers as architects and builders. And I think we have a great, our skills and our gift that we have is a way of seeing this different and better, <laughs> they're different than other people, but it's a, it's a gift that we can give to make people's lives better and we can uh, use it in the service of people at the top of the food chain. But I think there's some responsibility that comes with our skills 
and their uh, environmental responsibilities, uh, social responsibilities, and political responsibilities. And so what I'm going to do is show, uh, well, I'll show our projects with Jersey Devil, projects with students, and I'm going to try and emphasize what the difference is in the work, and maybe you can see it, when the architect is on site as the builder. And, you know, it, it, and what is possible if you can make your own work. So um, is that lighting is all right? Because you can make it darker if you want. If everybody can see it, that's fine. Mm. OK, I think this water is colder. I work with a group called Jersey Devil, where architects, artists, and inventors committed to the interdependence of design and construction. Actually, you got to do a smile at the same time. Um, let me see if I have a pointer. <laughs> I think I had a pointer when I started, but I believe I've lost it. No, I haven't. No, 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 I got it here. I don't need it yet, but I just, you know, just in case I need it, I have it. We maintain a small office, actually just a post office box and phone machine in rural New Jersey, but we're pretty itinerant working out of wherever our commissions take us. We do all the construction ourselves and generally live on the site, either in trailers or in crew built structures. These are some of the first buildings that we built. In the 60s, this is what we thought the future of architecture was going to be. Lightweight, air-supported buildings, easy on the pocketbook, easy on the landscape, incredibly high in fantasy content, either the thinnest of skins between you and the outside or kind of hermetically sealed in these alien envelopes. And it was a fabulous fantasy, but a fantasy fueled by cheap energy. Enormous amounts of air had to be blown into these things to keep them from falling down and enormous amounts of energy to heat them and cool them. So what we tried to do when we graduated from school, which is where we built these things, is to retain the spirit of these buildings in a more energy efficient um, practice, uh, pr package, excuse me. Uh, this is the first house we built, 1972, I think. It's, it, we never did an apprenticeship, maybe you can tell. Um, I think if you ever worked in an office, they'd tell you, you'd find out it was a pretty silly idea to use 2,000 pound manholes stacked with a crane to build a column or to frame a building out of curved barn rafters and uh, spray it all over with uh, urethane foam. Uh, it just, these are interesting buildings. This is, this is right out of school. They don't have that timeless quality, but they certainly show the kind of student energy that was around at the time. This is in 1974, I think. Um, no, I can't take that off. Uh, the Helmet House in New Hampshire, it's built out of ferro cement like a boat. Uh, this is the football house, the first building we built on the west coast. It's about, um, let's see, 45 miles south of San Francisco and only about a quarter of a mile from the San Andreas Fault. And I went to architecture school back east and we never really learned anything about seismic design. So we tried to do something that would, we just sort of eyeballed it. We tried to do something that would be really spectacular if the big one hit, maybe like an end over end uh, <laughs> failure with some goalposts at the bottom of the hill. Tony Costello, how are you? Um, yeah, Ball State, 10 and 0. There it is, right there, the football house. Um, <laughs> it's actually uh, a fairly smart way to build in a, a fault zone. Like the second growth redwood trees here, it's got a really deep concrete foundation, which, um, and then a wood frame, which moves with the tremors rather than resist them, which is the theory of something like a, a freeway. And I like to show, I like to start a lecture out with these buildings. It certainly gives us a, a standard from which we can rise up for. It reminds me of how much courage we used to have. Uh, and, uh, you know, these early buildings are, they're a little rough in terms of design and execution. They're like folk art or folk architecture. Um, but the, making them ourselves gave us confidence in our, our ability as builders. We learned about materials. Um, we learned a few other principles. Uh, such as the idea that structure can generate the form, a building can collect or generate its own energy, and the idea of simple geometry that has formed the basis for work that we've done since then. I think that's probably enough. Um, if you build yourself, you can take advantage of uh, trends or, or environmental issues that you want to deal with. When the first energy crisis of my lifetime hit in the about 1973 when gasoline went from about 25 cents a gallon to over a dollar, which is I think in real terms more than it is now, a lot of 60s activists became energy advocates and we became incredibly interested in what was then called 
It is unfortunately still called alternative technology, and we started using it in our on-site living conditions. And here Donna's making some chocolate chip cookies in a solar oven, which is just a, it's a window and an insulated box and some mirrors, and it swivels on an automobile tire. And she actually burned a roast in that. Okay. Great technology for parts of the world that are being um, deforested for firewood and cooking. You know what I'm going to do here, if you don't mind? Oh, well, because it's hot. How's that sound? Sound is still the same? Okay. Don't let it bind. Perfect. Okay. So we were involved in some of the first solar houses to give a sense of history. During the 70s, we built a number of them. This is the silo house. It's built out of prefabricated silos um, connected by a solar collector, which it's an air type solar collector, which is one of the first in the country. That's in New Jersey. This is in Colorado. It's called the Airplane House, one of the early passive solar houses, which is sort of diagrammatic. Uh, it's built like a funnel to uh, attract the sun through these direct, by direct gain through these windows. And there's actual, and it's stored in the thermal mass in the house. And there's actual movable insulation, windows that, uh, panels that slide over the windows at night. Very simple principle for um, passive heating and cooling. And it's earth integrated, and then it's a sort of very strong, dark, abstract silhouette against the white winter landscape. We were involved in some of the first earth sheltered buildings. Now it's called the Green Roof. I think at that time it was called the Sod Roof. This is, a, this is about five miles south of the football house, also in California. Same seismic area, but a completely different microclimate. None of those tall redwood trees, just these low, gnarled oak trees from here that can take these in wind on the site. This site is about 2,000 feet above sea level and 10 miles from the ocean as the crow flies. And there's in, nothing between it and these giant storms that come off the Pacific. And it, you see the wind has just plastered the grass back against the hill. We had winds of up to 125 miles an hour on the site when we built this project. And if you want to make a building very successful in this context, you need to consider that. So what we did was scoop out the hill and set the house in there so that the wind would go over it, but the sun would still come in where we could use it for heating and for daylighting. And then by following the contours of the hill, we push the wind around it and make a wind-free courtyard on the north side of the building and bring in the earth and uh, grass up onto the roof, gives it some ballast and integrates it with this amazing uh, site. Um, there's a view of the courtyard looking north towards the San Francisco Bay. And this is a picture this picture was taken probably 15 or 16 years after we built the building. So if you make the building an armature for nature, as time goes by, it hopefully just becomes more beautiful rather than becoming a maintenance headache. The inside, it's, as I said, direct gain, passive solar, uh, a lot of thermal mass construction, but uh, totally custom as per client request. All the, uh, these are quarry tiles on a radius on the, on the, concrete floor, all the partitions are either stucco or stone, and since they're not bearing, they stop short of the roof, which allows that roof to move up and down uh, seasonally. A lot of visiting artisans involved in making the cabinet work, and they're um, sort of a view, an aerial view from the north showing how it relates to that site. And I would maintain that in order to get this kind of intimate connection to the site, you really need to be there building it, that it's pretty hard to send these drawings out and have somebody do it. This was a payoff, I guess. If you build your own work, you can uh, be involved in uh, prototyping new products. I said we were inventors, and Jim Adamson, a partner in Jersey Devil, has a patent on this device, which he calls a rotolid. It's, a, um, it's an insulated panel, which is center pivoted and counterweighted. It opens in the winter. It's connected to a photocell. Uh, to it's off a reflective skin, so you get a nice spread of light and heat inside the building. It closes at night uh, to keep the heat in, and then, whoops, and then moves to the south in the summertime to block the high, hot summer sun, but still allow um, north light, which is reflected light without heat to come in the building. There's also ventilation that automatically opens at 85 degrees, so you get heat, light, and ventilation in one um, package, which is possible to even retrofit buildings with. It's actually an industrial design product. We were able, fortunate enough to get, oh, I guess about 20, 20 some odd years ago, a chance to use it on a big house, which we built for a surgeon. What was that? 
Does that have something to do with the webcast in uh, Indianapolis? <laughs> what is that? that is okay. um, oh, well. Guillermo, you're in charge. We're going to run a fairly loose ship here. Um, it's, a bit, it's a big house in, outside of Washington, D.C. for a heart surgeon, and it's um, like a lot of big houses, it doesn't need it, but it doesn't need its own nuclear plant to run it. It, got, it prototypes the rotolid here. There's seven of them uh, connected along the roof. It's got a, a corbel concrete base, a steel frame roof, and a sort of loose, non-bearing wood structure in between. And uh, the, if you build your own work, you can raise the level of craft, bring in uh, visiting artists and artisans. This, um, you know, we were able to prototype the rotolid here, but we were also able to uh, put a lot of artisans to work in the, in the old tradition. Uh, this is Charlie Fari, an iron worker from Washington, D.C., who built these really beautiful andirons for the fireplace as well as the fireplace doors and all the tools. John Walter from Nevada, Missouri did the uh, stonework. Tom Galbraith from New Hope, Pennsylvania built the front door. These two giant slabs of oak with the glass let into it, opening out into an airlock. If you look in that porthole, it's like being underwater at the uh, Sea World. It's a huge saltwater aquarium that wraps around the backside of the bar built by Doug Herr, the blur from Boone, North Carolina. It's in a kind of a lure of the sea motif. The soffit is a mirror image of the bar, the sort of seaweed style bar stools. It's lit from below. This is looking from uh, the pit in front of the fireplace. You can see it's one of the few bars where you can become disoriented before you even have a drink. Speaking about disoriented, these are the stairs by Tom Lucky from Brantford, Connecticut. And uh, it's right at the intersection of the cardinal points of the compass. Uh, right at the center of the house, and we had these cylindrical spaces around it, and Tom said the stair should be a cylinder as well. And this is, I think, something like 14 inch and uh, 5 eighths layers of Virendale plywood, and there's two ways to go through there. So Tom's built a lot of climbing structures for children's museums. I don't know if there are any around here. Um, there's a few in Illinois. And it's, it's like liquid kids moving around the structure. It's pretty amazing when people do it, and it's pretty fabulous to see somebody in an evening gown coming down these um, stairs. And he spent, I think, six months in his shop and two weeks on site uh, installing it. And plywood is a great material structurally. It's an unbelievable engineering project, product, but not very strong or not very good in terms of wear and tear. So he routed really slightly into each tread and used some of the carpet we were using on the second floor to spiral a path down into the living room. This is a plan view that shows you can actually walk down it. Because it's not obvious from a picture like that that you can do anything. And so normally a 10-foot diameter stair is this big hulking item that completely dominates whatever space it's in. But this one is so light and delicate that it, um, it just, as you move away from it, it just disappears into a series of lines. And in fact, if you stood on the other side of it and looked through, it would completely disappear and you'd be seeing the fireplace. So there's the stairs and the bar and that front door and some cylindrical bridges and a, um, some woodwork by our crew. Very high level of design and construction on this project. We were on site for almost um, three years. I just want to show a few pieces that show we didn't lose our sense of humor. This is in the weight room. Those are called lightweight by Jim Adamson. <laughs> These are uh, 1960, 61 or 62 uh, Chrysler Imperial taillights and I got them at the junkyard and we rewired them to 110 and they give this amazing kind of afterburner effect to the family elevation. Uh, Jim did all the lighting. It's about 10 miles from the national capital, and it's got those sodium vapor uplights on the west elevation. If you build your own work, you can relocate to remote sites, and we've done this uh, many times. This is the, pretty far away. This is my truck and trailer about 1,000 miles south of the United States border on the Baja California Peninsula of Mexico. Uh, I spend, uh, actually the site, the site is not here, but uh, where I'm taking the picture here is a hairpin turn and this really precipitous drop into the Sea of Cortez. And I didn't think I could get the trailer around there, but the beaches are public in Mexico. We had a little PV panel, some propane for cooking, and you could walk along the beach or you could take the truck. And I spent about a, almost a year down there working with locals uh, from the fishing village of Cardinal. Mex in Mexico, everybody really knows how to build. It's very simple construction. Not many tools are required. Uh, the concrete comes over from mainland Mexico in 50-kilogram um, sacks. 
They mix it on the ground and with shovels, or here we have a gas-powered mixer. They press it into concrete blocks. Um, we use, they use a, a little bit of wood is available. It's used mostly for form work. You rent it. Um, it's obviously, you know, here we would use clean plywood and form all six of these beams. Down in Mexico, we've got enough wood to put one together and we're passing it up in buckets. Very low technology compared to some of the work we did in the States. And steel is subsidized in Mexico. I think both steel and tortillas are subsidized. And we were able to get, um, I don't know, not anymore maybe, but for sure steel, <laughs> maybe not tortillas. Uh, get enough for the roof false work. And I built this jig and Carlos and Hanaro welded up 72, hopefully identical fish-shaped trusses, which we uh, hoisted by hand up to the roof where they span from this vaulted beam to two flat beams at the edges. So using identical trusses, we developed this warped palm frond shape that will shed the water, just um, rivet on some galvanized metal, tie a cage of rebar, and then with the mixer running from about 9 in the morning to 10.30 at night, the 32-man bucket brigade, uh, we poured it in one monolithic pour, followed, of course, by a fiesta grande con mucho cerveza. <laughs> you see, my Spanish got really good, Guillermo, on this on that trip, too. So we, uh, <laughs> I can order food and I can build things, pretty much. And uh, we waterproofed it against that four inches of rain that's there and covered it, the roof in red. The re covenant said it had, to, it had to do two things, the roof. It had to uh, pitch, but it didn't say which way it had to pitch. And it had to be covered in red tile, the roof. So it didn't say roof tiles, so I used floor tile. And it worked out pretty well for um, you know, cutting. This chimney is actually a vent, and these are vents along the parapet. And what happens is that the, uh, th there's a, a, a cement plaster ceiling on the lower level, so it's a, it's a hollow space, like an attic. And the sun beats down on that attic, uh, on that roof. The air heats up inside there, and it vents out through here and pulls fresh air in through the through the uh, grills here. And then also that inverted shape takes a breeze and intensifies it as it comes through from the sea. This is what it looks like uh, from, the, from the desert. Uh, two little storage buildings and a trellis going through to the sea. In the forecourt, we used stones. All the materials came from within a, like a eight mile radius, I think. We used stones from the beach here uh, in concentric patterns. These are celestia, they're perforated blocks for uh, ventilation and privacy. This is what it looks like from the beach. Um, basically three buildings with two breezeways connected by a roof. These are, this is the only thing that came from far away. These wood and glass doors were made by some friends in the States. At that time there was no industry to do this in Mexico and they're pretty important because they fold open and the whole house becomes a covered porch. Those are uh, bedrooms, a, uh, a living room and then a little study and kitchen that go out there for view and ventilation. And the floor cantilevers over the stone base, and then it's covered inside and out with these handmade saltillo tiles, which are very rustic. They have dog footprints in some of them. Everyone's a different size and shape. They're hard on the furniture, but it's nice as a counterpoint to the architecture, which is a little rigid and uh, rectilinear at the plan level. So there's folding doors both to the water side and to the um, from building to building. So there's a line around the house at seven feet, which relates to that horizon line. So as you walk around the house, you get these constantly changing frame views under this uh, pink, warping, cloud-like ceiling. Um, if, if you build your own work, a lot of times you get hired by other people that make things. And some of the best projects, or at least the favorite projects for us, have been buildings for artists where the program involves a place to work. And this is a house. This is a house in the edge of the Everglades. It's in a place called Homestead, Florida, about four blocks from the eye of Hurricane Andrew, actually. It did pretty well. Um, it's for a writer and a woodworker. And Norma's a writer, and she wanted her writing studio high enough to see the sunset over. And they also wanted a building they didn't have to air condition. It's a big challenge in uh, a hot, humid climate. Um, Norma's a writer. She wanted her writing studio high enough to see the sunset over the Everglades. Les is a woodworker. He wanted his woodworking shop on the lower level, of course, and rolling doors and a covered area to teach and work outside. And they wanted a little place in the middle where they could meet. This is like a, uh, a six or 700 square foot living space in between two workspaces. Nice program. And the building runs east-west. It's raised up to catch the breezes. There are screen porches on the east and the west as buffers against the uh, morning and afternoon sun. 
and is actually living space for all but maybe a week or two of the year. Uh, there's a radiant barrier in all the roofs. This is, uh, was discovered by NASA in the space program, and the Florida Solar Energy Center tested it and found, and Walter knows all about this stuff down in Florida, um, and found that with the radiant barrier in the roof and soffit and ridge vents, you can uh, uh, relieve the heat load by 95%. Uh, or you can block out 95% of the radiant heat, which is all the heat really in the tropics. Um, so there's radiant barriers in um, all the roofs and some of the walls. And the building itself ventilates through these big oversized Florida windows and the skin through these off-the-shelf louvers. And since there's a layer of foil in there, it's just like a spacesuit with air constantly moving through it to keep itself cool. There are big overhangs for shade. The siding uh, can't runs horizontally to emphasize the cantilevers. Even the ridge cantilevers, 11 feet with these little flag light fixtures. Um, a very horizontal uh, emphasis on horizontality as a counterpoint to these towering pines on the site. And the inside is basically one space of the living area. Good cross ventilation, uh, about a half a dozen paddle fans to move the air around, no full height partitions. And then the floor of the normal studio is a mezzanine grate. It's perforated so the hot air rises by natural convection, pulled in low and goes out through vents up in, and windows up in the clear storage. So there's almost always a breeze in South Florida if you can get above that dense underbrush to catch it, which was the theory of the old cracker houses that were built before the advent of air conditioning. So here is um, the house sort of literally reaching out of the jungle to get a breath of fresh air and looking cool on one of those balmy Miami Vice evenings. This is a, um, another house for two, two artists. Um, it's uh, in the Florida Keys. It's a concrete studio house on the beach. It's, uh, the studio is down here with the roll-up doors and their bedrooms upstairs to catch the breezes. Same thing, big overhangs, uh, good orientation, uh, radiant barrier, soffit, and ridge vents. And then the, for the workspace, the rolling doors open up. There's a breeze from the ocean that comes through and takes the heat. They're potters and takes the heat of the kiln and moves it away from the living space. It's part of a complex that includes an old building, historic building, built in the 30s by the Red Cross after the 1935 hurricane. Uh, this is the studio, our studio building, a stair tower, a bridge, and a, uh, uh, another existing carport with a, uh, let's see, let's see, yeah, there's a, a guest, guest house that we picked up down the road that's, uh, uh, it was the easiest thing that we could do. They could use it when the kids were growing up and then remove it lifted it up on the roof and then just dropped it down and folded it through. And there's this screen that wraps around the whole building. It's first line of defense against the hurricane, but it's also an armature for plants. And this is, I think, one $5 passion fruit plant after about three months. And this is, uh, I think, two $5 passion fruit plants after like six months. So in addition to providing some habitat um, and mitigating the, for animals and birds, and mitigating the fumes and noise of the road, uh, it, this building actually grows food, which is a lot of things that I think a lot of buildings are going to start doing, going to see it integrated into our stuff. Um, Jersey Devil has moved a lot out of, we moved pretty much out of residential, which keeps us from living on the site, and moved into public structures, which is a lot harder to do. So now, um, I think the place of an architect is to, re we can use our skills and build public structures rather than, I think the single family house is going to become sometime in the future, something that not so many people have. But, and anyway, we have tried to do more public structures. I'll show a couple. And uh, this is at a place called Seaside, which is on the Florida Panhandle. There's a, on this side is the Gulf of Mexico and some white sand beaches. This is the little beach town of Seaside. And in between are these dunes that are held in place only by the eel grass and sea oats uh, that keeps them from eroding. And if everybody from town walked across there to get to the beach, it would sample all the plants, the, they would die, the dunes would erode, and the town of Seaside would end up in the Gulf of Mexico. Some might not think it's that bad of an idea, but the developer hired a different architect for, decided to do a walkover at the end of every street, hired a different architect for each one. We got the one at the far western end of town, which was, I think if we weren't successful, it would be in the next town, I think. It's, we were, the, the, the town is very Victorian, and we were a surprise choice, I think, for one of these uh, pavilions, but uh, there's enough money for the walkover and also for a little beach pavilion. And our image that we thought would be a good idea would be like a beach umbrella and a series of waves. 
and we started at the beach and uh, and worked our way up to this um, this material, we, we made a pattern of one of these, and a local shop fabricated them. But this stuff is not treated wood. It's uh, juniper, which is actually eastern white cedar. Uh, it comes from the swamps near Apalachicola, which is only like 100 miles from the site. And it's harvested. It's almost dead material. And then it's uh, milled and air dried for a year at a place called Holt, which is only 50 miles from there. And then it comes back to where we use it. We're beginning to see, so the, you know, the point from where the materials come from and where we're using them is very close. And we're beginning to see um, that it's not a really good idea to say dig up marble in Vermont, ship it over to Italy, have it sliced into a bunch of panels, send them back here and slap them onto a skyscraper in Phoenix or Miami that's uh, uh, lit and air conditioned 24 hours a day and maybe 80% occupied eight hours a day. That if we keep doing this as a way of building things, there's not going to be very many materials by the time you all our architects. So the concept of embodied energy is something that's becoming more important to the profession and in our work as well. Wood is a sustainable resource if it's handled right. And it turns out that actually aluminum is not so bad either. It's all recycled content. It's, um, we were originally designed that pavilion to be wood. And it turned out that it, was, it cost too much <laughs> wood. And aluminum was cheaper. But it was not only cheaper, but it was lighter, more delicate, more durable. It took 160 mile an hour wind from Hurricane Opal, and we could put a paint on there that would last for 25 or 30 years to avoid the maintenance of wood. Plus, it, it's recycled content. It has its own little uh, rhythm as it goes up over the dunes. It gets a little wider at the top, becomes a place to sit, and um, the railings become the seats and then turn back into the railings and cascade down to the beach. This is what it looks like to a professional photographer. Very important for continuing education for all the guys on the, uh, on the webcast. Uh, seaside is one of the few places along the Gulf where sea turtles lay their eggs. And under the very best of circumstances, a sea turtle egg has a 1 in 10,000 chance of becoming a mature huge sea turtle. And if there's any light on the shore, it'll waddle towards the light and perish. So we have one here, one 30-watt recessed bug light. It's way darker than it is in here. It's a little like moonlight. And it is, it is a very romantic, you can't read out there, but it's a very romantic place. And actually, quite a few people have gotten married right here and done other romantic things. Like watch these beautiful sunsets that we have along the Gulf. This is the only building that we designed and didn't build. It's, um, uh, it's a Montessori Island school. It had to be built really quick and really cheap. And we're actually not good at either of those. But um, we did design it. and. Uh, the builder took out all the kind of difficult stuff, and it's a better building for it. I think it's a school. It's a Montessori school. It was also probably the only school in the South built in the last 30 years without air conditioning. There's no way they could afford it, and uh, there's no way they could afford to have it uh, to pay for it. It's a private school for 120 students, and it, it uses all the same tricks we used in the houses in that part of the world. It's raised up to catch the breezes, which creates a, a, a heavy thermal mass, uh, shady place underneath for community activities. Um, it has to be, it, well, the other th it has a uh, good cross ventilation, a radiant barrier, and this red fabric roof is actually a, a thermal chimney that helps to cool the building from the center. It had to be open to the air and breezes, but it had to be tight, obviously, in terms of security with 120 pre preschool kids. So everybody comes in through this little central stairway. There's a, a handicap ramp in the back. But they come into this main space where the parents drop off and pick up the kids. It's sort of the public space of the school where the plays are. And this is actually uh, vented to the outside. It's got a fabric roof, like a big tent. In a circus, the floor is stained the same color as the sea. And this is actually a screen, the giant uh, screen porch. There's a whole industry that it puts these big screen enclosures around swimming pools. It's very cheap to do that, as well as to um, get this pipe frame and fabric roof made. This is one of the four classrooms it's, um, you can see that it's not like a lot of other classrooms in that you can actually open the windows. How many windows in this building? Oh, um, you don't need to turn on the lights to see. That picture is taken with available light. And you can move the furniture. And a lot of classrooms nowadays are like 0 for 3. Each classroom has a little screen porch, lets a little bit of nature in, and a direct access to the outside, um, to the play area. 
and the whole school it has edible landscaping, which is much bigger now, and I need to go back and take a picture of that. But this is guavas, guanabanas, mangoes, uh, avocados, all started by the students and uh, have grown up pretty big. I think that's probably enough Jersey Devil work, but the next step would be, would be to see how um, this kind of knowledge and background that I had, which is somewhat unique as an art, with an architectural education, can be transferred to students and learning. And it turns out the job site is a fabulous uh, classroom. Stuff that seems sort of elusive on the paper looms up in reality when as soon as you try and make it on site. And I, I've been working, I think, I guess, since about 1982 at the, in Vermont at the um, Yes Tomorrow Design Build School. We used to have an exchange program with Tony Costello here at the school. We did design build projects at Ball State. Um, and a lot of Ball State students went to Yes Tomorrow and, and worked as interns. And I do a class there every summer. It's a two-week class. Um, it's called com Community Building Through Design Build or Community Design Build, something like that. And we build little public facilities. Uh, these are would be either college or architecture, pre-architecture or architecture students from around the country who come. Uh, the budgets are typically between one and two thousand dollars. I think this class was a, a four or five thousand dollar four-week class. This is the only one, but the other ones are two weeks. And this is a bandstand that we built, I think, 1994 for the uh, Waitsfield Farmers Market. And it's meant to echo the old covered bridges of Vermont. Vermont is uh, I don't know, similar to Indiana in that there's a frost line. There's about a four-foot frost line. And if we'd have spent all the money and the time that it would take to put these giant foundations under a little building like this, we would have used up all our time and money. So we put it on skids. You can actually put a pole through here and hook it to a tractor and drag it around, which is nice in the winter with Santa, I think. There you go. Which is fortunate that we did it because the farmer's market has actually moved three times since we built it. It's over here now. And it's just moved around this field, too. Um, Jim Adamson and myself from Jersey Devil teach the class along with Bill Bylosky. That's Bill who's a New York architect who is the, uh, he's the um, he works with Maya Lin when she, she doesn't have a license, so he's the guy that uh, gets it done. The emphasis is on hand drawing and local materials. This is a, you know, a recently fallen hemlock tree. This is a sawmill that's right there in the valley. You don't see too many of these anymore. I think there's some in Indiana, I think, down in southern Indiana, but there's a really sort of dangerous operation that produces like a one-man thing that produces something that's almost equivalent to dimension lumber. It's a little thick and thin and uh, fuzzy, um, also incredibly wet and heavy. But if you put it together quickly, you can build some pretty great structures with it for a fraction the cost of framing lumber. The Estomaro School is a constantly being renovated old ski lodge, and we work out on the tennis courts. We would assemble something, often uh, put it on a truck and deliver it to another part of Vermont. This is a little story time structure for the Magic Mountain Daycare Center. It was built in two weeks with however many students were in the last picture, maybe a half a dozen, uh, and cost between one and two thousand dollars, maybe materials. This is a trail shelter on the for the cross country skiers and hikers on the Mad River Path. Also, two week project. This is what that um, hemlock weathers to a pretty nice gray, which matches the old farm buildings in the area. Um, this is a bus shelf, bus stop, school bus shelter um, at a place where the old one had blown down. So it's got this sort of spiral pattern that resists the wind. <coughs> this is at the local affordable uh, housing complex, which would be the trailer park. Like here, you know, you have to build a roof over the trailer or it won't make it through the winter. But um, this is a, it's like a, uh, a play structure uh, for the kids, a little rocket ship. And it was generated because someone donated this big satellite dish. They don't use those anymore. I think they use all the little ones. And every spring for I, at least 15 or 16 years uh, at the University of Washington in Seattle, we have done a design build project. We're, st we're still on quarters. Ball State used to be on quarters. We're on quarters there. We did a design build project for a nonprofit someplace in the Seattle area. And these take place in 11 week quarter. Studio time is Monday, Wednesday, Friday, sort of, we start around 12.30, we start a little earlier once the construction ends to 5.30, and then on Saturdays from 10 to 2. We try, and we, we fabricate things outside a studio, but that's the time when everybody works together. And uh, these projects, 
used to be from seven to 10,000, and now they're creeping up to go or like 15, but still they're fairly economical. Um, this particular one is uh, within a mile or so of downtown Seattle. It's the Danny Wu International District Community Garden. There are 100 plots here for um, low-income gardeners. In order to have a plot in the garden, you've got to be over 62 years old and live in the international district. So most of the gardeners are Asian refugees. They're Korean, Filipino, Chinese, uh, Vietnamese, Japanese, and almost all non-English speaking. There's a lot of Asian American students at the University of Washington. Um, a lot of them still speak some of their native languages. And uh, we were able to talk to the gardeners and develop a program and some priorities for the garden. We did a master plan, and over the years, we've built a number of simple structures in a, in a bypass building style that's familiar to all the gardeners who use this garden. This would be a tool shed and uh, a vegetable washing and drying area. This is a pig roasting pit. They've had a pig roast there in the garden for over 30 years. It's a great, important community organizing event. And they used to have it in just a pit, but we built a more of a kind of a ritualistic space for it to happen. This is a pig being roasted for my class. The class was because they appreciated our work. And uh, we donated this plaque who tells who the students are and the donors, et cetera, and this bamboo tree, which is, of course, enormous now. We always have a ribbon cutting. It's a great photo opportunity for politicians to come and take, uh, make a speech. It's a, a chance for the gardeners to whip up this incredible feedback to show the students how much they appreciate their work. It's a chance for the students to say a little something about what the class meant to them, a chance for the dean to stop by usually for the first time and take a little credit, and uh, a chance for local politicians to weigh in around food. People are not likely to leave, so we do it. And, it's, and for a first building experience for students, it's really positive experience. I mean, how many of the, those clients for the million dollar houses make you a cake with all your names on it and says, thank you? So there you go. And, look, and we get pretty good press coverage. And everybody get really wins in a scenario like this. The uh, students get to work for some real clients and learn something about building. The uh, clients who couldn't afford the, really afford the materials get the fruits of their labor. The corporate sponsors get to polish their image a little bit by donating the materials. And the city and university get to take credit for having their community service routine together without actually having to do very much. And look what we get to build. It's a pretty fabulous statement in contrast to these monuments to unleashed office space in the background. What we're trying to say is that hand craftsmanship, ethnic tradition, and growing food are an important use, are, are important use of taxpayer money in the landscape. Uh, which is a lot of things, important use of urban land, I guess. Is there's a lot of things for a tiny project by a handful of architecture students to say. So this is our studio. It's not quite on campus. It's an old video arcade that's been uh, converted. I think it's a placeholder for the university. But we have enough room in there both to design and build. We've built trusses in it before. But we also have a pretty great shop at the university. It's the actual natural daylight. Um, and we start the students over there uh, very early in the class to um, learn how to use all the tools and make one project on their own, a little furniture scale sketch problem that they do over the first weekend so that they have a little hands-on experience before they start on the site. And then when it comes time to do the group project, I break them into two groups, and they brainstorm for about 20 minutes and make a list of all the really fabulous things about working in groups and all the potential problems that can come up when you work in groups and um, all the ways to reinforce the good stuff and mitigate all the bad stuff. And students love to do this. They love to whine about all the problems. Everybody likes working in groups, right? But, and it doesn't guarantee that the process is going to be smooth. It's not a silver bullet, but we keep it right up here. And we go through this. It doesn't take long. It takes about an hour before we start. And then we break up into smaller groups. We keep switching people around. And eventually, we reach a consensus. And as, when we do, the whole class can work as a group and put together a really fabulous presentation very quickly. And within, I'd say, the, about the beginning of the third week of the quarter, we make a presentation to the community. The drawings we use are not architectural drawings. They're more like what it would be like. We obviously avoid architectural jargon. Most of my clients don't even speak English, let alone architectural um, expression. And once we get the feedback from the community, we come back to the studio 
do the, for the first time often, construction documents, um, engineering, uh, permit issues, materials take off, and we try and be on site by the fourth week of the quarter or the weekend before. So this is a project we did, I think, about four years ago. This is a, by a nonprofit developer. This is 75 units of, uh, it's actually prefabricated housing, the framing is, uh, for um, first time homeowners making 30 to 80% of median income in Seattle. And they, they had the foresight to at least they wanted to put this big open space in the middle. They made this turnaround bigger. It obviously could have been, probably get more units around it that way. <coughs> but they waited till everybody moved in and then they called us and the class met with everybody to you know, see what you wanted. We thought they'd want something for the kids, but what they really wanted was sort of a place for family gatherings, a living room cookout. So these are duplexes. The units are incredibly small. Some of the families are pretty large. And they wanted a place where they could have a little celebration, a place they could sign up for. And so there's a barbecue and then there's some seating areas. Here we're pouring the uh, um, concrete foundation, starting the framing. And we use a lot of times this bypass system, which is easy for the students to understand. It's pretty good for exposed wood um, framing. This is all cedar that we're using here, which is a local material for us. Uh, those are the rafters, the purlin, and here we've got, it's a compound curved, it's a little 200 square foot roof over here, 200 square foot roof on this side, and then the trellis in between. And the reason for the 200 square feet is this is the maximum you can build without a building permit. Yeah, seems to work. Seems to work. This uh, clematis will come up here and fill in this part anyway, and there'll be plenty of shade as well over the seating areas. Um, this is in the back here is there's a the place to get the mail, and we built a little kiosk around it. There's a bulletin board, some donated PV panels that run low voltage white lighting in the pavilion. Uh, in our shop, we weld up these and have them galvanized. It's shear panels. This is for seismic. Shear as well, and also make a, a you know an armature for the plants. And so here's the dedication ceremonies. There's uh, music, food, um, camaraderie. It's a good place to break in the barbecue, cut the ribbon, and turn the project over to the community. And these are transformational experiences for my students. Um, this can, some of them have gone into nonprofit housing, some have gone into design building. I think the earlier it happens in their career, they always say, why shouldn't we do this more often? Or earlier, so does it change how we design everything else? So we've done some stuff for kids. This is a dragon. Asian Head Start Center, the younger kids crawl through here, and if you get braver, they go up here and run through the body and slide out the mouth, I guess. Sort of the reverse of what normally happens. This is for uh, Experimental Education Center, uh, working with physical and occupational therapists. A third of the students here are autistic or special needs, so uh, we designed a special space for motor, motor skill development for four to six-year-olds. It's uh, It was a covered... Um, area anyway, there's big beams and skylights, and they used to run around out here in the concrete, and we just hung everything from it, which gave us two levels. And this is recycled tires. It's a little floor, flooring made out of these recycled tires, and you can fall whatever this seven feet, whatever this distance is on it, you're about to fall. And they had two courtyards there. We did it another year. Um, Seattle's got a great climate, but it's a little damp and gray. So uh, if you can cover a space, you can use it all year. So we built this. Uh, fabric roof over another courtyard, and this is for the one to three year olds, the toddlers, so there's a lot of crawling. This is also that same recycled tire. So pretty good daylight in there and reasonably dry. This is at an inner city elementary school. <laughs> Typically you'll see, uh, um, you know, an asphalt play yacht and a chain link fence, a fence. And this is a, a whole, it's like a jump rope, this big double dutch jump rope culture there. Um, it's in center district of Seattle, and this is a big jump rope shaped trellis that goes down the whole block. And we made it out of the same thing, one up, one down, one up, one down, once we had a dig. And uh, it has sheds, an amphitheater for watching out on the, uh, on the pavement, a continuous bench for the elderly that live across the street. And it, you know, the normal thing you see is this, this asphalt lot and this dead fence. So this gives it a whole, um, a whole edge condition. Well, all they really asked us for was those sheds. This is at the same school. It's a play stage uh, built with that recycled plastic lumber and concrete. 
It's got the same kind of jump rope imagery on the on a uh, fence that keeps the balls from going in these classrooms. And since those are western facing classrooms, the students designed and built these sunshades that give the backdrop to the shades and makes the classroom more usable. This is um, at the City Arboretum, the Seattle Arboretum. Uh, there was an old structure there that had fallen down. It was a, a lath structure. They used it for plant sales. And they take the cuttings from the Arboretum, they develop them in greenhouses, and then they bring them out here and hardy them up a little bit and sell them with the proceeds going to the Arboretum. And they were having a problem. We needed a structure, first of all. But they were having a problem with crows pulling all these little tags out of the thing. So this is theoretically crow-proof uh, structure. And the students found this. Um, <coughs> This lamella technology, this way of using small pieces of lumber to build a span roof. It's quite a nice um, feature. And it's built uh, into a north slope. So it, um, it's a retaining wall on the north. It's open on the south. And these are all little uh, terraces that we built of this recycled uh, Seattle streets called Urbanite, I think it's called. This is at the Danny Wood Garden. This is a uh, gathering space. At sort of at street uh, level, there was a really pernicious patch of bamboo here, and you know because of that, where those elderly gardeners are, it's a pretty dangerous area, and a lot of drug deals and other kind of stuff that the police don't pay any attention to. So the more public spaces we can involve, the better. And so this is a place where we built, we broke in, we put in a new gate, some picnic tables and benches. And then this sort of experimental seating idea, which seems to work. I mean, the bums use it at night, but they roll out of bed in the morning. And the businessmen can sit there in the day. And there's sort of privacy in different uh, places. And it's really attractive to children. But it's not a play area. You know, you can't build a play area in the middle of the city anymore. It's way too insidious. But this, you can build a place like this, and kids can play on it, and it's fine. And for 10 years, almost 10 years, in the 90s, we ran a design-build program in Mexico as well. <coughs> in the winter quarter. And uh, I did it with another professor, Sergio Pallaroni, and we would uh, take, I think, 20 students from architecture, landscape plan and uh, planning down there, construction management. And it's a whole different skill set, much more sort of grunt labor. A lot of what these students are doing is mixing concrete from scratch here on the, on the ground. And we worked in the squatter settlements um, south of Mexico City. Uh, the fir first, we were there, we built a sister in the first year, and then this kiosco, which marks it as a public space. These are spiral brick forms where you pour concrete inside in a thin shell brick vault. And you know, we had a lot of help from the community on weekends. It's a really unique situation, because they won't send any teachers until they have a school. So the people that live there, hundreds of thousands of people in these squatter settlements, have a real incentive to come out and help. And so we had like four-year-old kids shoveling gravel. Uh, grandmas who are stronger than my kids bucking these big bags of cement. There would be music and beer and camaraderie, this incredible scene, which would be, of course, an insurance guy's nightmare in the States. But can you imagine that if you could, we could build our own schools this way, what it would mean to us and what it means to these guys to do it? Um, so we built, there's a three, the second year we built three classrooms attached. This runs east-west, so it's low on the south and high on the north. It's good cross ventilation. Um, Third year, we did the part that went north-south. It's a harder orientation, but the bearing walls between the classrooms extend out to shade it, at least during the, the school day. There's a little place to kick a soccer ball around in bathroom at the center, garden. And the work continued when we weren't there. Uh, the Mexicans, of course, have great skill. The main thing we really brought was the money, I think. And they could do uh, finish the windows and the paint. And the, I, I think. It was designed for 150 students, 25 a classroom, and we got 300 and something in there. We had a, a visiting artist workshop. Uh, Linda Beaumont came from Seattle and showed them how to use the old broken tiles and mirrors um, as a mosaic material. And you know, I signed up, we were talking today up in the thesis class about how, um, why I got into teaching, which is, you know, of course was for the insurance. But uh, <coughs> it's turned out to be, um, a mixed blessing. You get well. You get back more than you put into it. Teaching really it, it keeps me in touch with young people who are still optimistic and still still think their efforts can change the world and make it better. And that's a positive thing for a guy like me that might tend to be cynical. But I thought at least if I start a teaching job, I might put down more roots. But I've actually traveled more since I started teaching. And with the early days of Jersey Devil, this is in Finland, 
1991 with students from uh, University of Technology in Helsinki and students from Oregon. This is a watchtower. It's actually uh, it's a recycled catamaran, seven meters up, cruising through this grid of logs. It's been converted into a children's playhouse. There's little places in the pontoons. There's, there's a steering wheel, like a tractor seat and a steering wheel, and all these about 100 dashboards up there. It's like a spaceship. And the idea is that if the uh, polar ice caps melt with climate change, uh, Finland's going to find out first, and this way at least the children can be saved. It's an early climate change statement. <coughs> This is Rob Pena, teaches at the University of Washington with me. He's an architect and a river guide. And we did this studio with Washington and Oregon students up in Alaska. It's called uh, Alaska Outward Build. And we, we started with a boat trip and learned the sun angles because the sun never set and then built this log learning center. This is in uh, Ghana in West Africa with students from Miami University of Ohio, Gail Del Piana. Um, it's a library uh, made out of a shipping container with a little shade roof. And librarians from all over Ohio donated uh, the books. This is at University of Michigan. It's a, with engineering students, it's a uh, band shell, very light skin. You can see the engineering input. And this is with sculptors. This is at a place called Atlantic Center for the Arts in uh, Florida, um, where um, three artists come. I was with a poet, an 85-year-old poet from New York, and a composer. And each of us had a half a dozen poets, composers, and sculptors. I work with art students. And, uh, you're locked in one place for three weeks, and you uh, have all your meals together. And pretty soon, everybody's collaborating. And we built a space where people could go and write poetry or practice music, because they didn't have any place like that, too. And each of my students made a little piece. One guy made a table. Another guy did these things. And uh, this, I always have to show this, because all, of, all the students from Ball State that came to Seattle get their photograph taken at it. And it's, if, as long as I've been in business, I don't think I've ever done anything that more people have appreciated than this piece. It's the Fremont Troll. It's under the Aurora Bridge in Seattle. Um, we won it in a competition uh, against a few other artists, I think, like that, and was built with community labor. Um, it's, this is how it was built. Uh, it's a, you know, now you can do it with a computer. There we did it with graph paper. It's got uh, a grid of rebar in two directions, mesh. A Volkswagen was donated uh, without a motor, and school kids came from all over Seattle to uh, put stuff in there for a time capsule. Um, the art critic had written some bad things about it, you know, because I don't know of any other sculpture that was picked by public vote. And the art critic, of course, wanted to, and, you know, the NEA is always in trouble, so she wanted to say something, so she said, <clears throat> see, this is what you're going to get when the people pick. So a lot of people came out to help us build it. It was great. We got, uh, we got a guy with a stucco pump. We plastered this. And here are some like, Italian Finnish guys putting in the hair and skin. But still, it was only like $15,000 budget. To, it was a neighborhood matching fund grant uh, to build a public sculpture. So we raised a little extra money on site by selling free Montreal t-shirts and shower caps. The shower cap is the ultimate fashion statement in a city like Seattle where there's always a chance of showers. If you could find one of these on eBay, I would like to have one. Right? So um, <clears throat> we dug down and we found the old Aurora Street, which is perfect. Troll Plaza was done. We just poured this part. It makes it look like he's dragged that VW out of passing traffic. The city of Seattle gave us this big piece of the street, which, of course, they'll give to anybody who wants them. Uh, there's a leaking expansion joint over his head. So all winter long, there's this sort of drooly, uh, mossy stuff that slimes down over him. It's pretty good. And for the eye, we got a Volkswagen hubcap. We covered it with that prismatic diffraction grid. It's, you know, that uh, silver stuff. It looks like a trout. Um, the custom car guys use it. So when uh, it turns into a rainbow of color, when light hits it. So when the cars come up over the hill, the headlights hit that eye. There's this flash of light. It's the drunk driver's worst nightmare. And there it is <clears throat> at the dedication ceremonies. He's totally covered with kids, which he is all, all day long. Every day, the band is just getting down with some troll music. And a miracle happened. The sun came out in Seattle in December. We're so far north at 48 latitude that it shone in under the bridge and illuminated the visage of the troll. He's always in the news. These would be Tibetan monks chanting at the Fremont Troll lot going on up there in the Northwest. And then every year at Halloween, which is called Trolloween in that part of town, uh, 
have, we've had for 19 years, we've had a celebration. There's two or 300 people, mostly grown-ups, grown-ups, in, uh, in costume. There's this very kind of pagan uh, celebration with lots of fire and scantily clad people and stilt walkers, and they, they dance around for about an hour in front of the troll. There's a play that's totally unintelligible, and then they march off uh, down under this bridge and go off someplace and have a party. And so here's the view looking up from the ship canal. Uh, underneath, it shows, makes the urban design statement of what you can do um, in an urban space like this at the end of a really powerful axis like that, what you can do with dead space under a bridge, which is pretty much a problem everywhere in America. Uh, it makes the political statement, this sort of anti-car thing and anti-development thing that Seattle and Fremont in particular needed to make about that time. And it helped to start a community tradition, Trolloween, which will hopefully be around a long time after I'm gone. And a lot of things that the city got for less money than they would spend for a police car. <clears throat> and finally, to show that even the most humble structure can, as <coughs> boy, can aspire to be both art and energy efficient. This is my outhouse in Vermont. It, it's actually a composting privy. It's hard to see, but this is a building. This is a wall here. Looks like you're looking through it. This is also a wall here. It, um, it's covered in cement board. And then we went to the, uh, to the glass guy, <coughs> Barry Glass, and we got all these scraps of mirror that are left over from all the jobs and all these plates from yard sales. So it's covered here is what it looks like in the wintertime. This is in the summer, even more amazing. Really tricky, tricks the building inspector. Pretty good. But it's a little bit of a problem if you're in a hurry. This is what it's like in the fall. It's in there someplace, and there at night. Party. And this is how it works. This is from the, <coughs> from the downhill side. This is a 55-gallon Ben and Jerry's ice cream drum on a car jack. Here it jacks up heels over here. About the first foot or so is this uh, sawdust, planar shavings, the curly sawdust. There's a vent here, and the air goes through. And vent that takes all the fumes out. You sit here, the direct drop. Um, there's a drawer right next to you, and there's some sawdust in there. So after every use, you put in a handful or two of sawdust. I use it all summer. My guests use it all summer. Um, I come back in the spring, lower this down, and it's all fluffy and light and compost, uh, composted. I can toss it on the forest floor here. Um, there are, you wonder why we don't do it more often. There, there's no stink. There's no uh, flies. It takes something that we all have to do every day and turns it into a pretty fabulous experience. I didn't take that picture. That's a picture, photo credit goes to Jared Pileski took that picture from Portland, Oregon. <coughs> this is Van Peter. I need that. This is the only example of nuclear architecture that I have for you. This is a, anticipating a little political discussion too. Um, it's a cruise missile. It says, 15 times Hiroshima, danger, do not deploy in Europe. Gives incredible stature to this little shed in Vermont. Um, you know, they say we don't make any things in America here. You know, my sneakers are made in Malaysia. Give me the emphasis here. Uh, but it turns out that our biggest um, product that we manufacture, and certainly our biggest export, is weapons. I mean, everybody uses our stuff. Iraq, Iran, Israel, Palestine. And like any business, we create this climate marketing climate where there's a huge demand for it. And I took this picture <coughs> in a, I think many years ago, um, probably before the first Gulf War, which is before a lot of you guys, I didn't think there'd be another one of those. Before the first George Bush, I certainly didn't think there would be another one of those. In a very su uh, not too subtle display of his energy policy, deployed what I thought was a lot of these things, until this time, on Baghdad, which we knew then was the center of world civilization for 5,000 years, a lot longer than we've been around here. Um, the place where, where the Garden of Eden supposedly was, the place where both writing and numbers were invented, so really where history started. And when, if we ever get done with it, it'll look like a Peter Eisman project. It's a, it, it's a place where archaeologists used to work with spoons instead of shovels, and now, I don't know, I'm hopeful. Uh, but, you know, it's... Uh, it's pretty simple. Buildings use about 40% of all energy, which doesn't include the energy embodied in their materials and construction. Nuclear energy and oil and coal represent death and environmental destruction. Solar energy, 
recycling and renewables and recycling represent sustenance and survival. So if you want to contribute to the continuation of the species, you'll design and build energy efficient buildings like that solar cape across the street. Recycling is important. This is a recycled 1962 Chrysler Newport made into a fireplace. Uh, back, if you hinge down the grill, there's, back here is a zero clearance UL approved energy efficient outside air fireplace. I couldn't resist when I went to the junkyard to get it. They had this amazing saw. I just sliced it. We just recycled the first two feet. And uh, I got these taillights, these incredible taillights. Um, and uh, on this dimmer controls the headlights and the taillights. It gives this spooky kind of Stephen King flavor to the playroom here. And to show that, um, you know, it can work. Energy efficiency works in any style of architecture. It doesn't have to be weird architecture. This, here's the Chrysler Colonial mantelpiece. All that's missing is maybe like a roadkill up here. Be good. Like a spotted owl would be nice. I mean, we just had a pretty great election. Even Indiana, even Indiana went Democratic. So I'm hoping that we have a leader who will pay more attention to the birds than to the cars. I'm hoping we'll see. We'll see. This is me on the cover of the New York Times magazine <coughs> quite a few years ago. We didn't get on the cover, but we got inside. Uh, we've been in uh, architecture magazines, Time magazine, a couple books, and. Uh, we get invited to prestigious places like Ball State to show our work. I'm always a little surprised because there isn't really a lot of it, and it certainly isn't mainstream, but it's actually been somewhat influential, and we've gotten a fair amount, way more than 15 minutes of recognition for it. And I think it is possible to have a small architectural operation, I wouldn't call it a firm, <coughs> and have some influence and get some recognition. Um, if you stick to your guns and stay with something you believe in, also, if you retain a sense of humor, that's essential to anything you choose for your life's work. So there's a lot of work to do. I'm going to pass it on to you guys. Uh, don't sit around watching the tube or watching YouTube. YouTube now you watch. Um, toss that sucker out. Turn it into a solar collector. Hit the road. Put the wind at your back with one of these Jersey Devil T-shirts. Um, Pick up a copy of Devil's Workshop, 25 Years of Jersey Devil Architecture. There it is. They put the funk back in functionalism. Michael Sorkin. I happen to have three copies of those right here. And I'll sign them and sell them. After an inspiring lecture to pay for the trip, we'll do that. There's a studio at large. Uh, Sergio Palaroni, Christina Merkelback. Some of the student work is in that one. And uh, when it comes your time, go out and build something that doesn't become a burden on future generations. So that's all I've got. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much. And I think we have a few minutes for uh, perhaps a couple of questions or remarks. Yes. Mm -hmm. just, just a second so everyone can hear. A lot of the... Um, That's why they have them at 4 o'clock. I guess environmentally sound, I mean, all the buildings that you do intentionally are environmentally sound, but I was wondering how much calculations y you're doing or if you're just sort of flying by the seat of your pants because you know the concepts better than the calculations. <laughs> you know, I always thought that, uh, you know, we learned how to do, we have bought that Ed Masria book, you know, that Passive Solar Energy book tells you how to do them. And I did do all the calculations. The question was, and I guess everybody heard it, how much calculations is behind that stuff. And we, um, we did it for that, that funnel shape, the airplane house, and I calculated that out, and I did it right, and sized the glazing, and I checked everything. And that there were later times when I, I, we did a house in Palm Springs, it was a really hostile climate, and we had this idea. And I would call up these in energy guys, Phil Niles, who's a famous solar calculator, and, um, and ask him about it. He'd say, you know, you guys have a pretty good feel for it, and I think you probably get it right. And it's true that we don't. I think at the scale that we're working at, um, calculations are probably not necessary, probably because we, you know, right now, Walter and Bob Kester and those guys have it all in a computer and you can do this CalPass and all this stuff and learn it and I think that's probably okay. And you have to do energy calculations to get a permit these days anyway. But I think the big buildings, what we're starting to see is, you know, like that rotolid that we did that's controlled. We're, I think we're going to see some buildings that are intelligent enough to um, be able to change in response to climatic factors to either move insulation or um, open seasonally or 
many, many things that they're going to do. And those kind of bu buildings are getting to be pretty sophisticated things, maybe without the, out of the range of a single architect or designer, but now more of a team of environmentalists. You know, but we're a little bit like those old uh, you know, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. You know, the world changes, so you go someplace else. And so now we're working on very small scale community projects with students because, you know, nobody wants 60 some odd year old carpenters anymore that can't do calculations or can't draw on a computer. So um, I'm hoping that you guys will take some of the lessons of this period and uh, sort of stick these ideas in and take it to the next step. But today, you know, when as soon as by the time you go, and there's a guy coming on Friday, show, do all the building on with a computer. All what I do, you know, with these hand tools is going to be as obsolete as a guy who draws by hand sometime. But there's some good, you know, you can't always throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's some, I can't imagine not knowing how to sketch. I don't think there's a direct connection between this, whoop, the harp, boom, and, and, and the, hand. There, I mean, there, with the hand there is. With the mouse, I'm not sure if you get here, you know, because it's so abstract. So I, I, so the same, possibly the same thing with calculations, is what he was trying to tell me, is that the way we were doing it was so loose and free that we could intuit things that you would probably not end up with in the building if you calculated it out down to the last metro kilowatt or whatever it is. So, but a lot of it's just eyeball, yeah. Maybe one more here? Yes, just a second. So that your question will also record. I was just wondering how much of your, how much of a project is designed after you start construction? Is there a lot that kind of just That's happens? a really good observation. Because that is the difference between building your own work and designing it and sending it out to some guy done to build. because. In fact, all those houses, we would design enough to get a permit. And then we'd get inside there, and it, oh, oh, <laughs> it's usually a clear span, so we could mock up the partitions, show the people around, see where they wanted their walls. The other thing is lighting. You can clip on lighting. You can mock up light things. You can do the whole, you have the whole space at full scale to work at, too. There was, um, there was that round table we just did with uh, architectural record of design build guys, and Tom Dutton said that they were guys, his guys, students were working and they had the space there, and what they did was measure it all up and put it in their computers and then tried to design it in there. I mean, instead of doing the lighting around where it is. So a lot of our stuff is, it, what it happens is you're improv, it's like a musician that's improvising as you make it, or a sculptor that's working on it. So you get information from the project in the site and then you respond to it. You, get, you have a lot more information when you're there. The weather's changing, you see things you don't realize. You can get in trouble because you know, the temptation is to add stuff to make it nicer rather than take stuff away to make it a more affordable. Too. But definitely, and the students, when we do the student projects, those things are, students don't seem to know enough about building and drawing to really design the thing before we get out there. So when we get out there, we figure out a lot of that stuff and we show them and they say, oh yeah, we can do this. Good point. Hey, in, in closing, I just want to, to mention that uh, through the whole presentation is very obvious that uh, you're, you're having a lot of fun with this. And I think we cannot overstate how important that is. Fun, fun is very important to everything we do. Architecture is, at its heart, one of the most fun things you can do. Designing and building are right at the basic, takes us right back to when we were in the sandbox as kids and just having a great time. So if you can keep that spirit, it's good. Looks like Guillermo has it too. Absolutely. Even way up at the nosebleed level of administrator. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.